And this is scanned. It all began with the clicking of a telegraph key along a wire. Then the actual voice in a telephone receiver. Then messages and voices without wires. And now finally the picture and the voice of living persons spanning our whole country in one fiftieth of a second. This will be a fact tomorrow and you'll see it happen on your own television screen. I'm Rex Loring, pinch hitting for Bruce Marsh, who's in England on vacation right now. And tonight on Scan, we are looking at Canada's national television microwave network. Now, these are what we call station break slides. They're slides in our studios, but you see them as pictures at home. The stations are scattered all over Canada, and they're both privately and CBC owned, working together to bring you a national television service. And tomorrow, Dominion Day, all of them will be able to broadcast the same program at the same time from sea to sea, that's 3,900 miles, the longest single microwave network in the world. A microwave is, oh, how long would it be? About as long as an average cigarette, and that's a very short radio wave. Now, to carry it across the country, there are television towers, or microwave towers, spread right across the country, 3,900 miles, remember, about every 30 miles right across. That makes about 139 towers. Now, the last link was a very difficult one. It was the one that went across the Rockies. And there were problems there which were confronted, met, and beaten. One of them, for instance, was at the top of Lost Horse Mountain in British Columbia. They had to blast the top off to make a base for the television towers. There is the blast they made now. Presumably, the top had to be flat and firm to take the base of that tower. One of the other problems was a dog mountain where they had to set up a cable car, which took men and equipment, heavy equipment, to the television towers that were being built two miles away and one mile up. Now let me read just a short item from the current issue of the CBC Times where the general manager of the CBC, Mr. Wimet, is quoted as he spoke at a recent closed circuit demonstration of the microwave network. He said, many people have worked for this day. Besides seven of the major Canadian telephone companies which make up the Trans-Canada telephone system, there were the Canadian Pacific and Canadian National Railways. The telephone companies have built the coast-to-coast -coast microwave system and the railways have built, among other TV links, much of the French network and next year, we'll provide circuits to Newfoundland, a further extension of the longest television network in the world. Now, these towers we've been talking about, they are carrying 2,400 long-distance calls and two television programs at the same time. This they can do. They may not be doing it all the time. Now, these are actual broadcasting stations. The ones marked with a white circle are those already existing in the English language network, the black, or rather the white square, the connected French network stations. Now, most English Canadians probably forget that Quebec is a thriving and dynamic broadcasting industry and turns out some marvelous programs. There are, oh, roughly a dozen or so English and French stations to be added to the network. And they range from CJCB in Cape Breton, right across through Nova Scotia, the Maritimes, through Quebec, down into Toronto, Ontario, northern Ontario, into Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and into British Columbia, winding up at CHEK-TV in Victoria. Now, so much for charts and such. What exactly do these towers themselves do? Well, they relay the microwaves at the speed of light. A receiving antenna, you've probably seen many of them across the country. There may be one very near you. They look something like this. And there's another one. Now, these will transmit pictures from one of these antennae to another one further across the country. The signal is received here and goes down to the base. And in this hut, the picture is amplified almost a million times. And the picture is quality checked, likewise the sound. And then they're retransmitted up another cable to another transmitter point onto the next relay station. 
and eventually to the local television station in your neighborhood and via the transmitter to your own home television set. Now, what will be the first program? It bears a rather cryptic title, Memo to Champlain. Now, you'll see it tomorrow afternoon on Scan. Tonight, we were going to talk to its producer, Norman Caton, but he's very busy right at the moment. But we will talk to its writer, Len Peterson. And here in Studio One, we have a three-dimensional reproduction, more or less, of the map that we saw in Studio Six. It is, in fact, three-dimensional, with some of the towers actually located across the ten provinces, and painters are still at work getting ready to have it completed for tomorrow's show. And earlier today, there was a boundary line for one of the eastern provinces, but someone has since checked that it didn't take the turn they had written in there, so they repainted it, or are about to repaint it for tomorrow. Looking at the rest of the studio, it seems quite bare in comparison to normal times, reason being that most of the cast is not in the studio as it normally would be. It's in scattered points all across the country. There are also two other items that one normally doesn't see in a television studio, two broadcast booths, which you'll see over there. They're being used because there's two languages involved in this program, French and English. Some of the narration being done from one booth and some from the other. Now, the producer of tomorrow's program is Norman Caton. You'll find up in this control room. And we were to have spoken to him, but as a result of considerable activity and checking with the remote points across the country, we're unable to talk to him right at this moment. You'll see in there lighting men, script assistants, technical men, audio, video men, all rather technical terms, but they do indicate something of the activity that they're concerned in. Norm must have told us something of the actual problems involved in the show, but his job is going on now and will be going on in the next couple of days. One man whose work is almost done, the writer of the show, Len Peterson. Now, he probably wrapped up his work a couple of days ago, and all he has to do now is sit and wait for tomorrow. We'll talk to him and see what he has to say about writing the program. My, Hi, Len. My work was not uh, wrapped up a couple of days ago. <laughs> is this hence the stack of paper? Yes. Uh, I had to give up uh, using a briefcase, as a matter of fact, and start using a uh, suitcase to carry the script and material around. <laughs> Now, what about the, the general premise of the show? What is aimed at, and what are you going to cover in the show tomorrow? Well, uh, we hope uh, to show, uh, as well as we can, uh, the uh, sweep of uh, the progress of the country over the last 350 years. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, this year is the 350th anniversary of uh, Quebec, mm -hmm. and uh, is the 100th anniversary of uh, B.C., and uh, we're certainly weaving these uh, anniversary into the uh, show. Culminating in the electronic achievement of the network. <laughs> That's complete. true, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what about you yourself? Did you write this locked up in one room, or did you actually go out to all the remote, remote points we'll be seeing on the show? Uh, no, I traveled uh, across the country uh, from coast to coast, and uh, after I'd uh, finished my traveling, then uh, the CBC locked me up in the uh, Cassidy building, <laughs> on Front Street uh, until I got the script uh, uh, more or less into shape. Mm -hmm. Now, what about problems that you hit along the road? Uh, were you able to sort of plan this thing in advance, go right to it and write? Well, we started out with a, uh, a plan, certainly, uh, but uh, going out to the locations, we uh, came across things which uh, we thought uh, should go into the show, and uh, so as a result of that, uh, sometimes we revised our uh, initial planning. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the most notable things you recall from your trip across the country? Would it be places or people or what? Well, I, I have seen the, uh, the country before, so that uh, as far as the uh, terrain is concerned, uh, this was no surprise to me. Uh, but uh, I must say it was a wonderful experience uh, meeting some of the people whom we're going to uh, have on the show uh, and uh, spending time sitting with them and uh, getting their stories. What notable people can you recall offhand that you met in the trip? Well, uh, in particular, I would uh, 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 say that uh, the people who uh, sailed on the St. Rock uh, were a wonderful bunch of men, and uh, we are using uh, four of these on the show. Uh, three of uh, these men 
uh, sailed uh, through the Northwest Passage both ways uh, and for this uh, received uh, the Polar Medal uh, and uh, Barr, the, uh, the fourth man we're interviewing, received uh, the medal by itself. Mm -hmm. So these um, will be exciting pages then from Canada's history as well as the electronic elements. Uh, oh yes, I would certainly say so, yes. And uh, we're also able to, uh, to trace the development of aviation uh, from its beginnings on this show. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, uh, who was the uh, first Canadian ever to fly uh, in uh, Canada, as a matter of fact, in the British Empire, is going to be on this show. And uh, we also have uh, fellows who uh, uh, were uh, in the First World War and bush pilots and so on. Many exciting things ahead. Thank you very mm -hmm. much.